In this video, we're going to talk about uh, making cDNA and what cDNA is and uh, expression vectors. So the important thing to remember is that when we look at the human genome, the vast majority of sequences are these re repeat sequences that, that don't encode protein. And in fact, if we just look at the protein encoding uh, regions of the genome, it only accounts for about 1.5% of the genome. And oftentimes that's what we're most interested in as molecular biologists is uh, a gene that encodes a specific protein. But we don't want to just clone that gene from human DNA because the problem is, look at this, that most of that gene is actually introns that doesn't encode the protein that needs to be spliced out. Which means if we put that gene into a host cell and we want that host cell to make the protein, to transcribe and translate that gene, it won't be able to because it doesn't have the ability to splice out these introns. So what CNA is, is cDNA is the complementary, that's what the C means, the complementary of messenger RNA. So it is going to be the sort of DNA version of messenger RNA, which means it's not going to have intronic sequences. It will only have the sequences that come from exons. Okay? It will still contain right the five prime untranslated region and the three prime untranslated region, regions that we'll talk about a little bit later in this course. But the most important aspect here is that these messenger RNAs will lack introns and only have the protein encoding exons. So, oh. how do we make it? How do we make cDNA? How do we make DNA that is complementary to messenger RNA? Or that is the DNA version, I guess, of messenger RNA might be the best way to think about it. Well, you first need the RNA, right? So we need to get cells that we know express that gene and make that messenger RNA. Okay, so that's important. Let's think about this for a second. We know that all cells have all of our DNA, right? No matter what cell you look at, it's going to have the same uh, 3 billion base pair ha um, haploid genome. But that doesn't mean that all cells make all RNA. And right? so we need to find a cell type that makes the RNA that we're interested in. And this particular experiment looks like uh, red blood cells. So we take those red blood cells, and from those red blood cells, we purify messenger RNA. And the way we do it is that we run the RNA through a poly-T column. Why? Because, and again, if you don't remember this from a previous class, we will get to it later, all messenger RNA is modified by having a 3' prime poly-A tail that will conveniently bind to a poly T column. So you run that RNA through the column. Our mRNAs will bind to the poly T. Everything else will go through that column. And then you wash out your RNA, um, your messenger RNA. Okay, the next step is to actually use that RNA as a template to synthesize double-stranded C DNA. All right, how do we do it? Let's take a very close look at this figure here. In red is our messenger RNA, 5 prime, 3 prime, and the poly A tail. And to this, we add what's called an oligo T primer. And what that means, it, it is, first of all, it's made out of DNA. Second, it is single stranded. Third, it's only about 25 nucleotides long, and all of those nucleotides are Ts. Those will, as we kind of saw in the previous uh, figure, those will hybridize to the poly A tail of the messenger RNA. To this mix, we add an enzyme that we got from some viruses called reverse transcriptase. Again, this is like a 
all of these enzymes are tools that molecular biologists use to do specific things. Well, what's important about reverse transcriptase? It reads RNA and it adds to a strand of DNA. That's reverse of what usually happens. Usually during transcription, you we have enzymes that read DNA and write RNA. Well, this is reading RNA and writing DNA. That's unusual. So then, now at the end of it, you've got this double-stranded molecule that one strand is messenger RNA, the other strand is our cDNA. That's not good enough. We need this cDNA to be double-stranded DNA. So the next step is we add base, and that base degrades specifically the messenger RNA. DNA is resistant to base. And then we use a terminal transferase enzyme to add a bunch of T's at the three prime end of our single-stranded DNA. So now our single-stranded DNA starts five prime T, 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 and then ends three prime G, 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 G. Okay, next, we now add another primer. A primer that is, again, single-stranded, that is, again, made of DNA, and that is made up of a bunch of C's. So those C, 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 C primer will bind to this G, 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 G addition that we've just made to our single-stranded uh, cDNA. And then we add DNA polymerase, which reads the uh, DNA dun, 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 and writes DNA. Right? That's a normal DNA polymerase. And by the end of it, we have our double-stranded cDNA that is a version, a double-stranded DNA molecule that is the from or made from a, a particular messenger RNA. Now, what we ultimately want to do with this cDNA, this fragment of DNA here, is we want to transcribe it into RNA and translate it into protein. And to do that, we need to add it to what's called an expression vector. So an expression vector is a plasmid like any other plasmid we've seen. It has an origin of replication. It has a selectable marker. It has a polycloning site. But on top of that, it also has a promoter that is going to control the expression of whatever gene we insert into it. It has a poly A tail that is going to make sure a poly A tail gets added to whatever we insert into this. So we take our, whoops, we take our cDNA and we insert it right here. And we cut this, uh, this expression vector with a particular enzyme. We cut our cDNA with that same enzyme and we insert it in there. And now we have a recombinant plasmid that is an expression vector. It has a promoter to control the expression of this uh, gene, and it has a poly A tail. So now when we insert this into bacteria, now the bacteria have this new gene, right, that we've inserted from the cDNA that has a promoter, that has a poly A tail, it's got all this stuff, so that a uh, cell. Now, in the paper that you guys are reading, our host cells that you're using aren't bacteria but instead are human HeLa cells, Henrietta Lacks. That's, she's the origin of these cells, and we can talk about that origin a little bit later. Now, when you add a expression vector or any vector into a mammalian cell line, we call that transfection and not transformation. I don't know why we use a different term, but it's just something that to, to, be, um, to be aware of. We then culture these cells and we add a induction. We, we add a chemical that, that causes these cells to start um, producing, transcribing our DNA and translating it into protein. So now all of the protein that is encoded by that particular cDNA is being made by those cells. We can then lyse those cells open and purify that protein. And then we can run that protein out on a gel, and we can detect it. So let's take a look at figure 1E 
of the paper that you're reading. And it says, immunoblot using lysates from HeLa cells transfected with the control, so transfected with nothing, or an empty vector, that's lane one, transfected with pcmv 8 ajmjd 3 that's lane two, this lane here, or pcmv 8 ajmjd 3 s lane three, lane three. An arrowhead indicates the full-length JMJD3 protein. So this arrowhead right there. Let's take a look at this name. This is going to be important. What does PCMV8AJMJD3 mean? Well, the PCMV means that it is this particular expression vector, PCMV. You can buy that as a molecular biologist. You buy the PCM vector. You They ship it to you, and then you insert, what do you insert? You insert your gene of interest, your, your cDNA of interest, the cDNA that encodes your protein of interest, JMJD3. So there it is there, right? We've inserted it here. Now the HA, we're going to get into a second, but the HA, as you can see, is an inherent part of the vector. It stands for heme agglutinin, and it has a very specific role, okay? And we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. But my point here in this particular uh, um, figure is that I want to just draw your attention to the fact that your paper makes extensive use of expression vectors where we are inserting our cDNA that encodes our, our protein of interest, JMJD3, into a vector that when transfected into HeLa cells, we'll get those cells to produce our JMJD3 protein. Okay, so now let's take a closer look at different types of expression vectors. These are going to be expression vectors that allow us to add bits to our protein of interest. So for example, this is um, an expression vector that causes or makes a fusion protein. It fuses this HA onto our protein of interest. And why would we want to do that? Why would we want to add bits of protein onto our protein of interest? Well, we would want to do that because we're tagging the proteins for purification, or we're tagging the proteins for some way of detecting them, immunofluorescence, for example, or we're making reporter proteins. All right, here is an example of an expression vector that leads to the formation of a fusion protein for the purposes of more easily purifying the protein. Because remember, these proteins are gonna be produced in the context of the host cell, whether it's bacteria, whether it's a, a mammalian cell, and we need to purify it. Well, sometimes proteins are difficult to purify. However, if you add something to that protein that you know how to purify, then it makes it much easier. In this particular expression vector, what we have here is where you insert your cDNA, and right downstream of it is a his tag. It's DNA that encodes a whole bunch of histidines. So your protein of interest then is now going to have a whole bunch of histidines at the end of it. And we know that histidine amino acids bind to, very well, nickel. Which means that if we take these cells that produce our fusion, our his tag fusion protein, that if we put them into a nickel column, it will be very easy to purify those his tagged proteins. And we run them out in this column, and we use that nickel to purify that, to have those proteins attached to the nickel, and then we can purify that out very, very easily. Now, the details on how this particular experiment works is not important. The important thing is you know the reason why we tagged our protein with a histidine tail is because it makes it easier to pur purify our protein of interest. Now, 
Another reason why you would want to form a fusion protein is that it makes it more easily to detect them. So we're back to the same figure here, um, where we are using an expression vector that leads to a fusion protein. So our protein of interest fused to HA. What is HA? Hemagglutinin. Well, what's important about hemagglutinin? The only thing that you have to know is that it is very easy for researchers to purchase antibodies from companies that bind very well to hemagglutinin. Okay, so what happens here is you insert your cDNA of interest into this uh, expression vector where there is already hemagglutinin encoding DNA sequence right upstream, which means the protein that you get made or that, that ends up being made from this is this fusion protein, your JMJD3 fused to hemagglutinin. You're going to purify that protein. You can maybe run it out on a gel or maybe you can look at it in the context of cells as we'll see in just a moment. And you incubate that protein with an antibody that binds to hemagglutinin, an antibody that is readily available that you can get. That antibody binds to hemagglutinin. Then you add an antibody that binds to that one that then allows us to detect where this fusion protein is. Now this process here is incubating with an antibody and then a secondary antibody and then a conjugating enzyme. Don't worry about the details of that. We'll get into it in another video. Okay? But just know that antibodies that recognize portions of your protein are really important for detecting where that protein is. For seeing it on the gel here, for seeing it on the gel here, or for seeing it within a cell. So here we're looking at figure 1b. You're going to ignore this, the left images, and focus on the right images here. And what we have are cells that have been transfected with this vector, okay, with this recombinant plasmid, which means they make this fusion protein, which means if we incubate these cells in the presence of these antibodies, we can get them to fluoresce. And that's what we're seeing. So we know that these cells make JMJD3. Why? Because when we incubate them with these antibodies, they turn green. And that is a super powerful tool. Okay, and we'll get to why the experimenters are doing this um, later on in the course. Now, there are lots of different uh, uh, sequences of DNA that we can add to our cDNA, right, using these fusion vectors, these expression vectors, that will allow for tags to allow us to, um, to do things with those proteins. You don't need to memorize any of these. Uh, just know that there's a lot of different tags that we can, um, that we can fuse to our protein of interest. And finally, and perhaps one of the most important ways that you can tag or fuse a protein is you fuse your protein of interest to something called green fluorescent protein, GFP. In fact, the person who discovered this gene and started using it in this way won a Nobel Prize several years ago. And it was originally found in jellyfish, and it's the, the protein that makes jellyfish glow. And there's nothing that you have to do. The protein itself fluoresces under specific wavelengths of light. So all you have to do is you take a, an expression vector that allows you to fuse your cDNA to the GFP. You insert that into whatever organisms that you are interested in. And then you can see where that protein is being made simply by the fluorescence that occurs from that organism. Right Here, this mouse doesn't have the GFP um, uh, protein. This one does, and you can see that in fluorescent light. This guy glows, this guy does not. Here in a particular worm, you can see very specific cells are expressing our protein of interest, and we can see that by the glowing. Now, here's the important thing. This experiment here, where we are incubating with antibodies, it kills the cells. These cells are all dead. But GFP, we can see that without having to incubate with antibodies or anything special. All of these things are live. So we can watch 
an organism develop. And as that organism develops, we can watch the, um, the protein, right? As it glows, we can watch which cells it goes in and when it is expressed and when it's turned off and all kinds of important um, things that you can do because you're looking at a live organism. All right, our next video will be on gel electrophoresis.